everybody, and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know from past shows, the Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at Community Television. And every edition, we uh, highlight a group in Santa Cruz doing great, great work. And this week, uh, we are looking at the uh, Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury. And we're really happy to have Kim Horowitz with us. Kim uh, was the foreperson for the 2023-2024 Civil Grand Jury. is currently an alternate for this grand jury so she's doing kind of double duty and we appreciate her being here kim horowitz how are you i'm good good how are you i'm doing well thank you uh kim uh, for people who aren't familiar with you or your great work you've done in the community for a long time uh give people a little bit of your background and then how you came to be uh, a member of the santa cruz county civil grand jury Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I recently retired about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. I worked as a finance manager and a financial analyst in the high tech sector over in Silicon Valley. Was not very rewarding. I was more than happy to retire. Once I retired, I had time on my hands to do community work and civil service that I've always wanted to do. Um, in the past, it's been pretty tough. I was raising kids. And as I said, I was working. So um, the way I got involved with the civil grand jury was I saw um, a solicitation for people to apply uh, online, and then I saw lawn signs and things like that. And I thought, you know, coming out of retirement, I needed to not just keep myself busy, but I wanted to make a network of people, you know, meet a whole new network of people. Because when you retire, you fall out of your current network. They continue working. You aren't. So... Yeah. Um, and I wanted to meet like-minded people, and I figured anybody who would sign up to be on the civil grand jury was somebody I had something in common with. So I thought it was a great opportunity, so I applied. Yeah. And tell us uh, a little bit about uh, about the history of the grand jury. I know that you're mm -hmm. familiar with kind of uh, yeah, a little bit of its origins and its background. I think people would be interested in that. Yeah. So... Um, California is unique. We're the only state in the country that has embedded in our constitution that each county must convene a civil grand jury every year. So since, I don't know, our constitution was written way back in the mid 1800s or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's how long it's been in place. And uh, our law library has all of our reports going back to 1957. So you can yeah. look back and see some of the history. Well, it's a fascinating uh, process, uh, and I will say uh, to the folks who are listening and watching that I was uh, proud to be a member of the 2023-2024 Civil Grand Jury myself, and Kim was about as uh, great a four-person as you could really uh, ask for. It's a very, very difficult job. It's a very, very time-consuming job, even more time-consuming than being a Civil Grand Juror uh, itself. And, and tell us a little bit about uh, that, Kim, really what it takes if you're going to decide to put your application in and you want to serve your county as a civil grand juror? Yeah, so as a grand juror, um, you really are committing to 15 to 20 hours a week average, and the amount of time you spend really depends on how many committees you're on. Each person has to be on one of our standing committees, which would be um, working as an editor or working on this correspondence team that handles all the grand jury correspondence or working on the continuity committee, which looks back two or three years to make sure that county agencies that committed to instituting one of our recommendations actually followed through and did it. So that's another standing committee. Um, we have an IT committee. So people who are grand jurors, we're looking for a certain kind of skill set. Anybody can be a grand juror, but we sure. we really do kind of screen for certain um, certain skills. Yeah. So um, does that answer your question? I think I was. Yeah. And I know for myself, um, I had been involved and still I'm involved in, in, in a lot of different uh, projects uh, in Santa Cruz, but I really wanted to kind of broaden my uh, engagement with the county uh, mm -hmm. and to a larger extent. I felt that the grand jury service would be the way to go, but I had the time to be able to do it. And it's really important that you make that commitment and say, you know, I want to make sure that I have the time to do it. Uh, uh, on average, Kim, about how many people apply every year for grand so jury positions? Two years ago, with the, when I applied, there were 63 applicants. Mm -hmm. This year, there were only 33, I think. Yeah. So we need um, 19 jurors and 11 alternates, so 30 people. So we barely had enough people to, uh, to actually seat a jury. 
Yeah. And I know that those uh, those 30 that are chosen, then they are sworn in by the mm -hmm. by the liaison judge, who is now Judge Hanson. Yep. And uh, you get sworn in. And if you're one of the 19 people that's chosen by lottery, then you are part of what they call the plenary, which is actually the operating uh, body of the civil grand jury. Yeah. I had to look that word up when I first heard it. <laughs> I don't even swear. And, 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 but of course, as, as an alternate, uh, you're entitled to sit in on the grand jury uh, discussions. You know, I don't know how much to the extent that you can really participate in the decision making process at the moment, but I was an alternate uh, when I when I was uh, sworn as a grand juror, and that lasted about two weeks until I was you know, sworn. Is that uh, right? Uh, was it that I was fast? to the point. In fact, I got oh a call from you and said, "Steve, mm -hmm. uh, are you available this Thursday? We're having a grand jury." So yeah. I was very I was delighted to be able to serve. Uh, Kim, uh, you're really uh, very knowledgeable about kind of the grand jury process, having been a poor person and now being an alternate. I'm and I'm certain will be uh, seated <laughs> as a plenary member fairly shortly. Uh, tell us what the, this year is going to look like for grand jurors. For people who are looking forward and thinking, you know, maybe next year I might want to put it in an application. I wonder what that would be like for my year. Take us in from the swearing in, you know, all the way through the end when they're when they're publishing their reports. Okay, so yeah, you're sworn in, and there will be a, a four person who's already been chosen. They will set up the meetings, a uh, regular meeting time. And um, initially, when you start your meetings, it's kind of getting to know each other. There's some groundbreaking kind of, or what's it, ground? Anyway, some work where you do to get to know each other. Sure. And um, then you, you form committees. That's kind of the next step. You set the officers, you form committees and assign people to the standing committees. Then you start brainstorming ideas for um, investigations that you want to do. So the grand jury gets to decide what they want to investigate. Nobody tells you what you have to investigate, right. which is really nice. So um, we brainstormed, we came up with a lot of different ideas. And at that point, you vote on the ideas that you're most interested in. And any idea that gets four or more votes, they form an ad hoc committee and go off and do some preliminary research on their topic. If they feel that there's enough there to look into and do a full investigation on, they will write up a proposal bring it mm -hmm. back to the plenary, talk about it at the plenary, the plenary has reviewed it, then they vote on whether or not they approve the committee to go ahead and form an investigative committee and do their full-blown investigation. Yeah. And the, the committees will set up interviews with um, people who are related to that investigation topic, and they'll do a, a lot of online research, um, and they'll do that for maybe three or four months. But by the end of the year, they should have their initial investigation pretty much wrapped up. And once um, they come back in January, they're ready to start drafting their report. Right. And that's quite a process. It's a group writing process, which is interesting. <laughs> it's not as easy as <laughs> you're writing it yourself, yeah. as, Steve, as you know, because you wrote a couple of the reports and then it gets yeah. torn apart and reassembled. <laughs> and <laughs> Because everybody's got to, you know, have a say and agree on what they want the content to be. And each of the reports must contain uh, your findings, your primary findings, which are supported by facts that are in the report and have been verified. So it's kind of like a journalism sort of exercise. Mm -hmm. Then you, from those findings, you come up with recommendations that are in your report and that, um, our directive of what you want the county to do in response to what your findings are. And uh, they have anywhere between 60 and 90 days to respond to you, whether or not they're going to adapt, adopt your um, recommendations, they're not gonna adopt them, or they will think about it, or it's in process. Those are the four responses they can have. So, um, and those reports tend to come out like the last quarter of the term. And the term goes from July 1st to June 30th. Right. Yeah. yeah, our reports pretty much all came out the end of May and during June this year. So if folks are uh, thinking about applying and they figure they've got the time to do it and they believe they've got the requisite, requisite skills to be a you know, productive member of the civil grand jury, what kinds of things can they look at? You know, who can they examine? What performance are they looking at? Uh, what operations or what kind of things are, are within their purview? 
Right. So we're talking local government here. Uh -huh. County. Yeah. So any county um, organization, county elected officials, um, nonprofits that may be associated with the county that are the county's kind of sponsoring or funding, you right. can look into. So or any um, what do they call LAFCO? Um, special districts? Special districts. Yeah. 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 That kind of thing. So you have your choice of any of those things. Yeah. And as people know, uh, there are multiple layers of, uh, of bureaucracy and agencies in both the city and county of Santa Cruz. And, and if someone has an idea about what they would like to examine uh, because they have personally been affected by some decision that's been made or or they think that perhaps, you know, this uh, agency could could use the money that they've been allocated a little more efficiently, that's something they could uh, inquire into and maybe mm -hmm. even uh, offer a proposal about. Are you talking about like somebody, a yeah, of regular course. resident? Yeah. yeah. Well, residents can um, submit complaints to the grand jury, mm -hmm. and uh, we get quite a number of them. And the grand jury, they're taken to the grand jury to review and decide whether or not they want to do an investigation on these complaints. So I think last year there were two, we did nine reports. I think two of them were directly as a result of citizen or resident complaints. Yeah. So it's very much, uh, can be anyway, a collaborative effort between the people who are actually sitting as uh, civil grand juries and regular citizens who say, gosh, you know, I'm really troubled by the operation of this particular agency, let me submit a complaint or report, and it's reviewed thoroughly and considered by the grand jury to perhaps be the basis of a, of a, of a uh, report. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, Kim, uh, again, for people who are thinking about uh, uh, making application and, and becoming a civil grand jury and serving their, their community like this, what kind of support do they get in terms of training uh, mm -hmm. throughout, at the beginning and throughout the year? Yep. So uh, civil grand jurors and alternates can all sit in on a two-day training that is provided by a state nonprofit called the Oh, CGJA, I'll just say the acronym. California Civil Grand Jury Association, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> so they're all former. They happen to have that. That's, That's great. Yeah. Um, great organization, by the way, wonderful. Yes, people. they yeah. are all former jurors. They've been trained to come in and train. And you do a two-day training with them, and they lay out all the different uh, parameters of the, that the Civil Grand Jury has to abide by and um, just gives you great background on how to do your job, how how to do an interview, how to write a report, or what the process should be. And they also go through the penal code with you so you know exactly what your restrictions are. And uh, that's really helpful. But actually, you don't, even with that training as a juror, I mean, I see it with this year's jury. It's, it's a bit of a struggle to get going because you just don't know right. what you don't know. Yeah. For instance, we have a pretty uh, tight uh, civil grand jury domain. We use Google and a lot of people aren't familiar with it. So you have to learn that and you have to learn the security um, measures that we have in place. Um, it's just, it takes, I would say the first month or two, you're really just learning what you should be doing. Um, and it takes a while. So this year, <coughs> excuse me, this year, some of our jurors from last year, you're one of them, Steve, uh, signed up to be trainers. And so, because we know we struggled when we came in last year with no help really yes, indeed. at all. Yeah. Um, other than our initial training. And so this year, our trainers actually sat down with each of the jurors as they got onboarded and got issued their badges in their computer. We sat down with them and walked them through some just very basic initial training on the computer. And each person is assigned somebody they can go to if they have more questions for follow-up. Because we felt like last year, maybe some people dropped out of the grand jury because it just was too intimidating. Yeah. So we're hoping to slow down the the resignations this year. Yeah. It can be uh, a challenge and can be a bit overwhelming if you're not familiar with the software you're being used or the parameters of what your work is going to be like or the very strict definitions of what you can and can't do. Once you kind of become more comfortable with that, and I think part of the onboarding, which was really a great idea that was suggested by some of the grand jurors from last year and, and really aided in a way by the, the, the current admins, really mm -hmm. helped people to kind of just relax a little bit and be able to kind of get into the work 
work uh, maybe a little quicker and a little with a little more clarity uh, yeah. than we were able to do. Yeah, I, I know that, uh, that that many people come into this and they're not really certain about their their writing skills. They have personal skills. Mm -hmm. They may have interview skills, but I said, well, yeah. am I going to be expected to write a report and and mm -hmm. what I do? You know, how am I going to do that? And I know that the civil grand jurors get support during the year uh, with uh, with writing workshops. Yeah. And, and I think it's also important to say that you don't have to have every skill. You know, as long as you've got the whole spectrum of skills somewhere on your grand jury, you're going to be OK. You can be a yeah. good writer, but not be very good on computers. You can be really good at editing, but you don't want to get involved in research. It doesn't matter if you've got all the holes filled, you'll be OK. So I yeah, don't want yeah, people yeah. to feel intimidated about joining the grand jury because you're supposed to have certain skills or you have to know the computer. Yeah. Yeah. We had people who had almost no computer skills at all that, mm -hmm. that joined the grand jury and stayed. So yeah. it can be done. And I think that's uh, another reason why some folks and uh, demographically, uh, the grand jury really appeals to folks who are a little bit older, uh, perhaps on uh, yeah. uh, independent of independent means or not working or retired uh, so they can really devote the time to it. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're raising families, they're, they're still developing their professions. So you get up people who are a little bit older who may not be as comfortable with their technology as mm -hmm. some folks who are younger. That's true. And I think it's also important to mention a little bit off topic, but um we do have older people on the grand jury just by the nature of the work you have to do it during the weekday if you're working if you have a regular full-time job it's really difficult to participate fully so we'd really like to get younger people we really work at trying to get younger people it just is really it's tough to get over that obstacle this year um well last year we had only one person from south county south county tends to be underrepresented mm -hmm. on the grand jury this year we've got a handful of people um from south county um on the so we did overcome that kind of inequity but yeah. the age thing i don't think we're ever going to really be able to resolve yeah. It's an interesting uh, conundrum, really, and uh, it's not unique to the civil grand jury. Mm -hmm. In a lot of the civil grand jury, in a lot of organizations that I'm involved with, uh, it's difficult to get younger people involved because they are, you know, raising their families, they're developing mm -hmm. their professions, they're doing things that are time-consuming in themselves, and find it very difficult to find the time to serve their community in, in such a broad-based way. And, and so, as people go through the year. Uh, and you say now that they're just starting their term, you know, they're going to be getting uh, to the point where they're maybe uh, identifying some issues. I know uh, the, the issues themselves are confidential. Uh, mm -hmm. The grand jury's work is confidential. Uh, the grand jury does not tell people what they're investigating. Uh, however, uh, California law does provide that the grand jury do a jail inquiry every year. And so there's always a jail tour. Tell us a little bit about that. So, yeah, I guess there used to be what an inspector general or something that that was responsible for um, going in and kind of looking at touring the jail and writing a report that got eliminated and they put the civil grand jury in charge of that. So the civil grand jury every October is supposed to go in and tour the main jail, um, the women's jail uh, and oh, the one in Watsonville, Roundtree, Roundtree? and the juvenile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> excuse me. So we did that. And you don't have to write a report, but you can write a report. And it just so happened that we had people on the committee that um, had some really strong feelings about the jail and uh, decided they wanted to write a report on it. So, Indeed. Yeah. yeah. And, and people should understand that uh, you don't go into being a grand jury with a particular ax to grind. This is not an organization that's just going to be critical of elected officials or agencies. They're going to try to make some constructive observations about what can happen. And uh, if uh, we had gone into the jails and looked around and said, you know what, they're they're operating the jails uh, about as well as they can with their staffing and their and their funding, uh, then you might not have done a report at all. This particular grand jury found that there were some things that we needed to highlight that the community needed to find out about. And this is, in my view, and, and perhaps yours as well, uh, the, the, the mission of the grand jury is to tell the community you know, what they uh, might be interested in looking at in terms of what issues are important to them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 
and so that that's uh, th that's part of uh, something that people want want to think about when they're when they're thinking about uh, becoming a member of the civil grand jury. Now, this current grand jury, uh, they're just as I say at the beginning of their term of service. They're just beginning to kind of uh, get themselves organized. They've been through their training. They're kind of settling in. So at this point, uh, kind of where are they in their, their, their plenary sessions? I think they're right now kind of in the process of um, brainstorming topics and discussing them. And yeah, they're, they're in that brainstorming kind of process right now. So they haven't mm -hmm. settled on exactly what they're going to be doing yet. Yeah. And I know that uh, some folks uh, really enjoy that kind of uh, brainstorming process. That's another Another aspect of the civil grand jury that I think uh, people find very attractive is even within the group, it raises the level of a debate about about issues. You know, it yeah. brings awareness and that mm -hmm. as much as anything, it's not simply the report that's produced at the end of the year, but it's the ideas that are really generated during mm -hmm. the year by the grand jury that, that are benefiting to the community. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the kind of debate and the discussion that goes on about what you want to investigate. And even during the year, bringing back your talking about your progress, your committee comes to the plenary meeting, talks about where they are with their reports. And there's a lot of input that's given during that process and during the editorial process to really, <clears throat> really improve your investigation process and your reports. I think you would agree as a fellow editor the yeah. editorial process was amazing. I mean, we got some drafts of reports that just really, I thought, I don't know if this is really going to work. But through the editorial process and many, many iterations of going through the report, um, we really improved it. And the reports that we turned out, I think, are first class. I mean, they're, I, I hope that people will actually go out and look it up and um, and read them. And, and I would agree, and this is a kind of a, the substance and process of, of a civil grand jury and a civil grand jury report as they go through you know, several uh, drafts and they go through the editorial, but then they go to county council, who is an advisory position for the civil grand jury, and then to the uh, liaison judge before they become finalized as a report. Right. Yeah. The, you know, a lot of the pushback we get from our reports I hear or I see in the press are like, they're just, these people are amateurs. They don't really know what they're doing. They're not experts in these fields. They kind of, you know, you got to take their, their recommendations with a grain of salt. And I, I take oh, exception with that <laughs> because it's true. We are not necessarily experts in the field, but we bring a fresh perspective, some new sets of eyes to the problem. And I think we come up with some really good insights and some good recommendations uh, from our investigation that I think people should take seriously, um, yeah. you know, so, but. And, I and, and honestly, I think that they, they do, at least from my experience as being a grand jury and evaluating the reports that this last grand jury term uh, produced. But I can tell you that uh, for anybody who is interested in the process of a civil grand jury uh, member, and is interested in any issue that uh, really impacts them as a community member, you will learn so much through the investigation mm -hmm. uh, and through the interview process. I was uh, one of the uh, members of the CZU Fire Reporting Committee, and we did a published report. I, I learned more about that fire uh, than I, than I than much more than I'd ever known personally. Yeah. And I know, and I'm hoping that the community would have benefited by the fact that, that I was able to learn a lot from my fellow committee members and that report reflects a lot of the information that people really would be interested in knowing about their report even though it's a bit in the future in the past now there's things to learn about so we don't repeat the mistakes in the future exactly and i think our recommendations address that you know yeah. in the report that you know going forward if you do these recommendations if you adopt these recommendations you'll be better prepared for the next while yeah. and it's really i think a very rich uh part of the Drangier experience is getting into a subject and really expanding your own knowledge about it. You know, as you're talking to experts, you know, you're conducting interviews with people in the city or county who are who are experts. This is their job, you know, mm -hmm. to serve the community in this way. And you learn from them, you know, what the substance of their job is mm -hmm. and whether or not they're doing it uh, properly. And, and, and in a great uh, many instances, they are. Well, I was going to. I was going to say, I, you know, we're so cynical about politics these days and government yeah. and all that. 
I came away so impressed with the caliber of the people that we interviewed for the most part. They're yeah. dedicated civil servants. And I, yeah, I just uh, was really impressed. And besides that, you're right. You learn so much, not just about the topics that you're investigating. You learn so much about the county operations. Yeah you know, how they work. And that's why, you know, not everybody is able to access uh, uh, with uh, in, in time to do it, you know, all of the grand jury reports that are written. But if you get a chance to go on the, the website, uh, scgrandjury.org, and is that what it is? And you have your reports there. Uh, if you just are, Google Santa Cruz Civil Grand Jury Reports, you'll know. You and yeah. just to take a look at them. Which is uh, it is a terrific opportunity, even just to glance at some of the findings and recommendations, which is such a great way to organize this material. And maybe you not want to read through, you know, 20 pages of narrative, but you might want to take a peek at the findings and recommendations that these people labored for a year to develop for the community so they can look at it and say, well, that's a good finding. Yeah. And I understand that. And that's a great recommendation. Why don't I push my public officials to adopt this? Mm hmm. Yep, it's uh, it's true. Because and it's not even, only the grand jurors, it's the community. So, somehow they have to take uh, the bit in their teeth at some point and say, you know, I read a grand jury report that said that you could do this better. You know, are, are you going to? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. uh, you can tell us a little bit about the process that the the agencies that uh, this would be the subject of an investigation have a certain amount of time after the public after the report is published to respond to the recommendations and findings that were included in the report. Right, exactly. And they do to the best, I think, of their ability oftentimes. But uh, what follows, well, whether that actually becomes policy, whether it becomes procedure, whether it actually results in, uh, for instance, our roads being in better better shape than they are, which is one of the subjects mm -hmm. of, uh, of a grand jury, wonderful, in my view, grand jury report from this year that, was, that discussed our rural roads. Yep. And every time I drive on the roads, and I'm driving, I just bought a car recently, I am reminded of that report yep. and, and the and the information that they provided to people who are wondering why our roads are in the condition they are and maybe why they can't be a little bit better. Right. I think also if people read the findings and recommendations, that great, that's great. I think they also might want to read the summary, yeah. just a quick summary at the very beginning of the report that, yeah, yeah. that will keep you from having to read. Yeah. The reports go into great detail. Yeah, you know, 30 pages, 25, 30 pages each. But if you just read the summary and the findings and recommendations, you'll get a good idea of what the report is about. Well, Ken, this has been a wonderful visit. Uh, we're at the end of our uh, our time all too quickly. Uh, there's so much uh, to learn and know about the civil grand jury and such a great opportunity. Thank you again for your work, not only as four person for the last term, which I was lucky enough to experience, but also your work now as an alternate and soon probably to be a plenary member. So thank you so much, Kim Horowitz. Uh, thank, you. thank you for being here, a wonderfully engaged community person, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Okay. Uh, this has been Steve Plage, and thanks for looking in at this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight, and we'll be back with you shortly, uh, examining another nonprofit doing wonderful, wonderful work. Try the civil grand jury. I think, you, jury, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised and very gratified. We'll talk to you later. Bye now. Steve, bye-bye.